Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker. And in this video, I want to go through 10 things that most Jehovah's Witnesses don't know about their own religion. Now, before we begin, I want to make this a fairly brief video and for that reason, I'm not going to go into a laborious discussion for each point. I am, however, going to reference various videos uh, while I'm talking that go into each issue in more detail. And I will also try to provide some links in the description in case you're watching this as a Jehovah's Witness and I say something that you have never heard of and you just assume that I'm lying. Rather than make that assumption, I would urge you to either check out the video that I'm referencing or check out the link in the description and see for yourself whether I'm telling the truth. I should also just add that this is far from an exhaustive list. There are lots of things that Jehovah's Witnesses don't know about their own religion because they aren't encouraged to think critically about their beliefs. They are just told to believe unquestioningly in everything that they're told and not scrutinize their religion. Only other religions are to be scrutinized, not God's one true religion, which Jehovah's Witnesses consider their religion to be. Anyway, with all those disclaimers out of the way, it's time to address number one, and these are, by the way, not in any particular order. Number one on my list is a loophole in the Shepherd book regarding sin. Now, this is something that I would imagine the majority of witnesses don't know about. Even lots of ex-witnesses don't know about it. But if you look in the guidebook that elders use, this is a, a copy of it, a hard copy. Shepherd the flock of God. There is a, a paragraph in chapter 8. Chapter 8.25 and this is talking about situations that require a review of an appointed brother's qualifications. And point 25 addresses the situation of an elder who has committed a disfellowshipping offence years in the past and the matter was never addressed. In other words, he kept quiet about it. So the body of elders may determine he can continue to serve if the following is true. The immorality or other serious wrongdoing occurred more than a few years ago and he is genuinely repentant, recognising that he should have come forward immediately when he sinned. Perhaps he has even confessed to his sin, seeking help with his guilty conscience. He has been serving faithfully for many years, has evidence of God's blessing and has the respect of the congregation. So, <laughs> an elder who has been serving faithfully for many years has the respect of the congregation, and all that time has been keeping quiet about a serious sin for which he could have been disfellowshipped, can be let off the hook under certain circumstances. So it pays, apparently, to keep quiet. And of course, the absolute hypocrisy here is that such an elder would then be called upon to sit on judicial committees against people whose wrongdoing or perceived sin is being addressed immediately or very soon after it was committed. Now, perhaps realising that this created a ridiculous disparity between the way elders' sins are addressed and the way everyone else's sins are addressed. There is a similar provision in chapter 12, which is dealing with determining whether a judicial committee should be formed. And this is headed, Serious Wrongdoing That Occurred Years in the Past. This is dealing with basically everyone else who isn't an elder. And under point 57, it says... Depending upon the circumstances, serious wrongdoing that occurred years in the past may need to be handled by a judicial committee. However, 
if wrongdoing occurred more than a few years ago and the individual is genuinely repentant and recognises that he should have come forward immediately when he sinned, counsel by two elders may be sufficient. So this is basically saying, if you do something that you know is wrong, that you know is considered sinful according to the many, many rules that can be found in this book, if you will only keep quiet about what you've done, if you'll only keep it to yourself or cover up what you've done, as long as more than a few years go by, then in all likelihood, you'll never have to answer for what you've done. But the annoying thing is that witnesses aren't told this. So this is a secret provision in a secret book that only elders have access to. So you'll understand why I've included it in my list of things that Jehovah's Witnesses don't know about their own religion. Because chances are, if you speak to a Jehovah's Witness, or if you are a Jehovah's Witness, it's unlikely that Witnesses know, because they don't have access to this book, and in fact they'll feel very guilty for even downloading this book, which you can do, uh, by the way. How are they supposed to know that if they only keep quiet about their sins, then conceivably, and this is, by the way, not necessarily uh, going to happen in every instance, it's conceivable that an elder or a body of elders might not apply this provision. But there's, a, there's at least a loophole uh, or a chance that you can just have a, a bit of counsel and move along. So that's point number one. Point number two is the secret child abuse database. I've done multiple videos on this, but perhaps the one most worth watching is one of our most recent Watchtower in Focus episodes, episode 25, JW versus Watchtower, in which the team and I discussed the fact that Watchtower, as we speak, or as I'm making this video, is appealing before the Supreme Court of the United States for the organization's right, right as a religion, to keep confidential records of child sex abuse. Think about what that, that means. They are fighting for the right, not just of them, but for all religions, because any decision that's made in their favour will affect, will have to be applied to all religions. They are throwing aside the organisation's proud uh, legacy of winning battles in the United States Supreme Court that will improve the lives of everyone. So I'm, I'm thinking of the battles on flag saluting and religious liberty and all that sort of thing that go back decades. They're throwing that proud legacy away and saying, we think that religions should have the right to keep their own secret records about child sex abuse. And we feel we've been wronged in this area because in case after case, the lawyers of child sex abuse survivors are demanding that we turn over our records and we don't want to do that. So the very fact that they are appealing at the United States Supreme Court to keep confidential records on child sex abuse establishes, as far as I'm concerned, beyond any doubt that Jehovah's Witnesses keep a secret child sex abuse database. But that's by no means the only line of evidence to establish the existence of this database we can also look at the Australian Royal Commission in 2015. When they were doing their research into Watchtower, they asked Watchtower's Australian branch, well, not just asked, demanded that Watchtower's Australian branch produce all their records on child sex abuse going back to 1950. And when they did that, 
they found that the organization in Australia had been sitting on details of 1,006 perpetrators or accused perpetrators of child sex abuse who had accumulated between them an estimated 1,800 victims. And that's just for Australia. So you can imagine how many thousands or potentially tens of thousands of records are being kept on perpetrators globally by Watchtower. But we're still not done with proof that the database exists because if you follow the work of journalist Trey Bundy, who's done a lot of reporting for Reveal on the issue of the cover-up of child sex abuse, you'll know that he has interviewed lawyer Erwin Zalkin, who is a major thorn in Watchtower's side right now. And it's been reported by Trey Bundy in Reveal that Erwin Zalkin has in his office actually part of the database in a filing cabinet, albeit in redacted form. Erwin Zolkin succeeded in forcing Watchtower to release this small portion of the database after taking testimony in the Lopez lawsuit from a Watchtower official named Richard Ash, who said in court that the database was kept at that time on Microsoft SharePoint. And he tried to argue that it would be too problematic due to the amount of records for them to produce the database, at which point Zolkin produced an expert who said that it wouldn't be that difficult at all. But in any case, we have physical evidence of the database sitting in a lawyer's office we have a Watchtower official saying in court that it was kept on Microsoft SharePoint. We have the Australian Royal Commission taking 1,006 uh, records on 1,006 perpetrators in from the Australian branch alone. We have Watchtower defending its right at the United States Supreme Court to keep this database. And we also have, if you're interested a fax that was sent by Watchtower to BBC journalist Betsan Powys following the BBC Panorama special in 2002 titled Suffer the Little Children. In that documentary, it was revealed that this database existed and potentially had around 23,000 names of accused pedophiles on it. And in response to this revelation, Watchtower wrote to Betsam Powys, who presented the information, and said, actually, it's not that many names, it's less than that. <laughs> so they didn't deny that they were keeping the database, they just disputed the number of names that were on it. So you have there multiple lines of evidence that the Jehovah's Witness leadership keeps secret records on men and women who are accused of child molestation. They keep these records on their own file servers, on their own databases. They don't release this information to the authorities. They fight in the Supreme Court to be able to keep this information confidential. And every second that it's kept confidential, every second that it's kept beyond the reach of law enforcement is time that predators that are on that list can use to abuse more children. And for the most part, Jehovah's Witnesses in general are completely oblivious to all of this. Onwards to point number three, and it's the Mexico Malawi scandal. When I first woke up from my Jehovah's Witness indoctrination, I did not have a clue about this, but it's one of the many gems that are revealed when you read the book Crisis of Conscience by former governing body member Ray Franz. He reveals this dreadful double standard that existed in the 60s and 70s where you had witnesses in one country who were forced to show their Christian neutrality by refusing to obtain a card 
in what was essentially a dictatorship. There was only one party and the ruling party demanded that all citizens have a card showing them to be a member of this ruling party. And Watchtower insisted that witnesses in Malawi refused to do that, even though this decision led to witnesses being persecuted in the most grotesque and brutal way. I won't go into all of it now because I go into more detail in my video on the subject, which you are welcome to check out. In fact, I'd prefer that you check out that video rather than I, rather than me going into all the details. But at the same time, as witnesses in Malawi were being asked to take a firm stand for Christian neutrality, declaring themselves to be no part of Satan's political system of things, a situation was allowed to exist in Mexico whereby Jehovah's Witnesses were allowed to bribe officials into giving them a Cartier card which declared young men in Mexico to be eligible for the reserves, for the military reserves. So Witnesses in one country were being allowed to again bribe officials into giving them this document which again very much identified them as part of Satan's system as having gone through uh, training so that they were eligible to fight for the country if needs be and at the same time witnesses in Malawi were suffering and even dying due to taking a completely different stand on the same issue of Christian neutrality. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this and you don't know about the Mexico-Malawi scandal, please check out my video where I go into it in more detail. For point number four, I want to talk a little bit about the infamous blood teaching, the requirement for Jehovah's Witnesses to die rather than accept a blood transfusion because I don't think most Jehovah's Witnesses are aware that this requirement is neither theologically or biologically sound. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's not theologically sound because number one, this is a dietary restriction. The Bible writers had nothing to say about a medical, a life-saving medical procedure that wouldn't be invented until many centuries in the future. But even if physicians in the first century Middle East were transfusing blood to save people's lives, there's a very good chance that Jesus would have been in favour of it because whenever he was arguing with the Pharisees, as he frequently was, on Sabbath violations, most notably the fact that Jesus would heal people on the Sabbath. So he would do work to improve people's quality of life on a day of the week when Jewish tradition required, indeed demanded, that he do no work. And the Jewish religious leaders took issue with this. And whenever they did so, Jesus would appeal to the rabbinic principle of Pikwach Nefesh. I've almost certainly butchered the pronunciation. <laughs> Can never quite remember it. But this Jewish principle insists that the preservation of life comes first, comes above observing the minutiae of Jewish law. So for Watchtower to come along as they did in 1945, and start saying that it's better for Jehovah's Witnesses to die than for there to be any transgression of the use of blood as mandated in the scriptures, is to completely overlook the fact that Jesus himself insisted that life comes first if there was any conflict between the saving or preservation or healing of human life and the observance of the Mosaic Law Code. So that's why the blood ban is theologically unsound. It's also biologically unsound, because the simple fact is that humans transfer blood cells between them, normally and naturally. 
If you know anything about pregnancy and you know anything about childbirth and how babies are raised, you know that in breast milk there are, there is an abundance of white blood cells. And white blood cells are one of the main blood components that Jehovah's Witnesses are prohibited from receiving medically. So they're prohibited from receiving white blood cells in a life-saving hospital environment, but they're allowed to receive their mother's white blood cells in the form of breast milk when they're babies. Does it really make sense that God would have this huge disparity? There are even instances where red blood cells end up being transferred from the baby to the mother at childbirth, which causes the issue of RH sensitization, which again, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you might want to look into. So it simply cannot be said biologically that there is never any exchange of any of the main components of blood in a normal human life. And you have to ask the question, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, why would God be so against the use of blood medically when biologically uh, blood cells or some of the main components of blood do get exchanged and it's all perfectly natural? Point number five, and how could we not mention the nearly 10-year affiliation between the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and the United Nations. So this story came to light uh, in the Guardian newspaper in 2001 when it was revealed that even though theologically Jehovah's Witnesses are vehemently opposed to the United Nations, if you're a Jehovah's Witness you know that um, the wild beast from the book of Revelation is said to be a manifestation of the United Nations. The United Nations is supposed to be an abomination that is um, an attempt at doing something that only God's kingdom can do, which is bring peace and prosperity to all the nations of the earth. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you don't need me to explain <laughs> how the United Nations are looked on theologically by Jehovah's Witnesses and their leaders. But wouldn't you know, when it suits Watchtower, they are willing to put those issues and put those denunciations to one side and jump into bed effectively with the UN by becoming a non-governmental organisation or NGO for the Department of Information between the years of, let me see, I think it was 1992 and 2001, and it was because of the exposure in the Guardian newspaper that the affiliation, the, the nine-year affiliation, came to an end abruptly. And the reason why Jehovah's Witnesses don't know anything about this is because there is no mention whatsoever made of this significant story in any of the publications. You won't find anything about it on JW.org. There's a total information blackout. Well, I say total. There was a letter that was sent to some of the branch offices, or I think all of the branch offices at the time, giving some cookie-cutter excuses as to why this huge act of hypocrisy had been allowed over so many years. They made some excuses about um, needing a library card, which I deal with in my video on the subject, which you are welcome to check out. If you are a Jehovah's Witness and you've never heard of this before, as you almost certainly haven't. But yes, this is a huge thing that most Jehovah's Witnesses are entirely oblivious to. Now, point number six involves shunning. And though most Jehovah's Witnesses are perfectly fine with shunning disfellowshipped ones, they see it as a means by which the organization stays spiritually clean. They see it as a protection. They also see it as a loving provision against the one who's being shunned, they tend not to think 
about the psychological damage that ostracism can do and the fact that nowhere in the scriptures does it require that shunning even be extended into the family arrangement. In other words, it's one thing to say, oh, such and such a body is no longer a member of our congregation and we're not to have association with him. It's another thing entirely to insist that this goes even into the family so that fathers and mothers don't get to speak to sons and daughters and vice versa. But I didn't want to talk to you about that necessarily. I wanted to talk to you about the fact that most witnesses don't understand that what they perceive to be a command from Jehovah only dates back to as recently, effectively, as 1981. And this is again something that comes to light when reading Crisis of Conscience by Raymond Franz you learn that there was a state of affairs before 1981. So between 1955, when the disfellowshipping arrangement began, in fact, if you go back to 1947, there's even an awake denouncing excommunication as pagan. In 1955, that changed and they, de and they decided, hey, we're going to have a bit of excommunication in our, in our religion. But between 1955 and 1981 it was still possible to leave on conscientious grounds by disassociating and still have some contact with believing witnesses who were friends and family. This status quo existed all the way up to the publication of the September 15th, 1981 Watchtower, which changed everything and said, actually, you know what? If someone disassociates... This is effectively a sin and you should treat them just the same as if they've been disfellowshipped for sin or wrongdoing. So from 1981 onwards, it became impossible to leave the religion for conscientious reasons. So when Jehovah's Witnesses talk about shunning being a command from Jehovah, what they probably don't accept or haven't really thought of is the fact that effectively this command from Jehovah only dates back to as recently as 1981 because that's when the rules became as they are today where there was no way out of the organization if you simply stop believing. For point number seven I want to talk briefly about the many failed predictions for Armageddon. Now, this is something you're sort of familiar with as a Jehovah's Witness, but it's only when you get out and you sit down and you do the research and you find out what's been printed in the publications going all the way back to the time of Russell and Rutherford. I don't know whether you can see in my collection, but I have there a copy of Millions Now Living Will Never Die, which predicted 1925 as the date for Armageddon. Going further back than that to Charles Taze Russell, you had the prediction that 1914 would be the absolute limit for Armageddon. Witnesses today don't know any of that. They might know about 1925 because you can find references to 1925 in the literature, but they assume that 1914 has always been taught as the end of the Gentile times and the beginning of the last days. What they don't know is that Charles Taze Russell believed that the last days had begun in 1799 and again he wrote quite clearly that 1914 was the date, the absolute limit when he expected uh, Armageddon to come. So 1914 was a false prediction for Armageddon. 1925 was a false prediction for Armageddon. You then had 1975, which I would imagine a lot of witnesses do know about, but many will have bought into the false narrative that Watchtower now um, promotes, that this was just the fault of a few individuals who... <laughs> 
who took things too seriously, who took too seriously what was written in Watchtower's own publications pointing to 1975. And there are a number of other dates which I actually go into uh, in this video, which you're more than welcome to check out. It starts to become very, very clear, <laughs> if it wasn't clear already, that this is a very, very flawed, man-made organisation that is guilty, has been guilty over many decades of building up people's expectations that Armageddon is just around the corner only for those expectations to be dashed. Now for point number eight, I have to tread carefully because if I haven't already upset YouTube's algorithms and made my video liable for demonetization, I almost certainly will if I go into detail as to what was written in Rutherford's Declaration of Facts, which is actually printed in the 1934 yearbook. I love the fact that Watchtower was so deluded and so arrogant um, and so self-righteous that they thought it was a good idea to print the Declaration of Facts in the 1934 yearbook so that generations into the future, witnesses couldn't deny that the Declaration of Facts is a thing and that it had actually been written and promoted by the organisation. So what can I say about the Declaration of Facts without getting my video demonetized? Okay, so... Let's put it this way. Most Jehovah's Witnesses are aware that during the Second World War, their organization was firmly against the government of Germany and its leader. And there was even a campaign, uh, a telegram campaign, launched by Joseph Rutherford to denounce the leader of Germany. But what nearly all Jehovah's Witnesses, or probably at least the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses, don't know is that this campaign was only launched by Rutherford because his efforts to, how, how shall we say it, ingratiate the organisation to the government of Germany and its leader were rebuffed. They failed completely. And again, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you're going to be saying, that's completely impossible. Don't be ridiculous. Well, again, just look up the 1934 uh, yearbook and find the Declaration of Facts. It's all in there. The Declaration of Facts was read out at a convention in 1933. And it was an attempt at convincing the government of Germany that the Bible students presented no threat, that in fact their principles and their ideas were in harmony with those of the government of Germany, and to demonstrate that they shared so much common ground with the government of Germany and its leader, they said a number of things in the Declaration of Facts that I will read to you while probably substituting certain words so that, again, my video isn't demonetized. So they said, for example, instead of being against the principles advocated by the government of Germany, we stand squarely for such principles and point out that Jehovah God, through Christ Jesus, will bring about the full realization of these principles and will give to people peace and prosperity and the greatest desire of every honest heart. Bearing in mind, we're talking about the principles of the government of Germany in the 1930s. Okay. A careful examination of our books and literature will disclose the fact that the very high ideals held and promulgated by the present national government are set forth in and endorsed and strongly emphasised in our publications and show that Jehovah God will see to it that these high ideals in due time will be attained by all persons who love righteousness. So, glowing endorsement 
of the high ideals of the government of Germany in the 1930s. I'm, I think I'm doing well with my words here and not getting this video demonetized, hopefully. Um, okay, so it also says in the Declaration of Facts, the greatest and most oppressive empire on earth is the Anglo-American Empire. By that is meant the British Empire of which the United States of America forms a part. Very direct, uh, explosive, you could say, language that's clearly intended to, again, ingratiate the organisation to the government of Germany in the 1930s. And one more quote for you, which with which I need to be very careful. It has been the commercial people of Middle Eastern origin of the British American Empire that have built up and carried on big business as a means of exploiting and oppressing the peoples of many nations. This fact particularly applies to the cities of London and New York, the stronghold of big business, this fact is so manifest in America that there is a proverb concerning the city of New York which says the <clears throat> own it, the Irish Catholics rule it, and the Americans pay the bills. So this is the sort of language that appears in the Declaration of Facts. But because Watchtower knows, they know how bad this is, they only refer to the Declaration of Facts as being historically significant without actually quoting from it, or at least they certainly don't quote from these parts that I've read to you. And that's why most Jehovah's Witnesses are completely ignorant to the fact that at this key point in history, Watchtower made efforts to ingratiate itself to arguably one of the most evil regimes that history has ever seen. Now for point number nine, I want to take you back to the Shepherd book because there's an interesting provision for the appointment of elders. So I'm in chapter eight, which deals with the appointment and deletion of elders and ministerial servants. And under point nine, it's dealing with candidate elders or ministerial servants who are separated or unscripturally divorced. Unscripturally divorced means that they are divorced by the authorities. They have a certificate of divorce, but they're not acknowledged as being free to marry by the congregation due to there not being adultery or a confession to adultery by one or both parties. So uh, th there's a bit more to it than that, but that's roughly what unscripturally divorced means. So we're talking here about candidate elders or ministerial servants who, again, are are separated, really, or they have moved on to another relationship without there being necessarily any grounds for divorce involving adultery with the previous spouse. And it says, who is primarily to blame for the marital problems? What were the circumstances surrounding the separation or divorce? Who was responsible for the separation or who pursued the divorce? Did both sign the decree or in some other way indicate their agreement? How long ago did the separation or divorce occur? What is the brother doing to try to reconcile? Is his mate unwilling to cooperate with his efforts? If so, why? How is his situation viewed by the congregations involved? How do the elders of the mate's congregation feel about the brother? When separation and divorce are involved, there may be deficiencies on the part of one or both mates that make it necessary to limit special privileges because one or both mates may not be viewed as exemplary. So what it's saying here is that when a man who is a Jehovah's Witness 
gets separated from his wife, there are some questions that need to be asked before he can be considered as becoming an elder or a ministerial servant. And you saw what some of those questions were. And you're probably thinking, why on earth is Lloyd banging on about this? <laughs> what does that have to do with things that Jehovah's Witnesses or most Jehovah's Witnesses don't know about? Well, I would argue that most Jehovah's Witnesses don't know that the founding presidents, you could say, of their organization, I'm referring to Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Rutherford, most witnesses are unaware that neither of those men would fare very well if their private lives were subjected to that kind of scrutiny. In the case of Joseph Rutherford, he had a wife and a son, and yet he certainly well into his presidency, he had nothing to do with them and they lived separate to him. So Joseph Rutherford, uh, from, 20, from 1929 onwards, lived at Beth Sarim, which is another thing, by the way, that most witnesses are unfamiliar with, the whole story surrounding Beth Sarim. But anyway, Joseph Rutherford lived at Beth Sarim in San Diego, from 1929 onwards and in another part of California I think in another part of San Diego um, his estranged wife lived separately from him and things were actually so bad with his wife and his son that neither of them attended his funeral in 1942. So you have to ask the question would Charles Taze Russell or Joseph Rutherford have even made the grade of elder if we were examining their life according to current rules on morality and current rules on how elders are selected. And that's before we even get into the, the ins and outs of the jellyfish incident with Charles Taze Russell Again, do the research on that. Or in the case of Joseph Rutherford, the rumours of infidelity with a Mrs. Berta Peel who left her husband to be Rutherford's assistant who travelled with him everywhere, who was supposed to be his nurse and dietitian, even though she had no formal training as a nurse or dietitian. That's, again, another thing that witnesses are completely unfamiliar with. But regardless of whether you buy into the rumours or whether you buy into the jellyfish story that came out during the divorce proceedings between Charles Taze Russell and Maria Russell, you have to ask, is it right that these men are, look, are looked up to and admired by witnesses in the 21st century, even though by current standards both would arguably have failed to even be elders according to the current rules and regulations surrounding the appointment of elders and servants. This is again an area or, or a subject regarding which most Jehovah's Witnesses are completely in the dark. Now if I haven't already triggered YouTube's extremely sensitive bots and algorithms to demonetize this video, I almost certainly will do with this final point, with point number 10, which has to do with the way that racism has been prevalent in certainly the early history of Watchtower. This is again something that you're oblivious to as a Jehovah's Witness, and it must just be said that no one's suggesting that there is racism today. I'm, I'm sure, I don't look, I'm sure in some parts of the world there may be issues. There certainly may be issues with individuals. Certain cultures may find it difficult. I know there were issues, for example, during apartheid in South Africa with um, equality not necessarily being observed to the extent that it should be. 
but I'm talking about actual things that were written in the publications that were either outright racist or served to otherwise perpetuate the myths and misconceptions surrounding race that were prevalent in the decades when Watchtower was, you could say, in its infancy. Now, rather than going through an exhaustive list of examples, I would just point you to an article that I wrote on this subject. The article is titled The Racist History of Watchtower Literature, and I cite a number of articles um, and references from past publications, mostly from the magazines. In terms of Charles Taze Russell, I don't think his racism was quite as bad as the racism and anti-Semitism of Joseph Rutherford, but he did still have some very backwards views. He wrote numerous times, for example, about how one day the Ethiopian skin would be changed to white. This was some crazy idea that he had and that he repeatedly referred to in the publications. I've already mentioned recently about the fact that when the photodrama of creation was being shown in 1914 at one theatre in New York City, the organisation found itself responding to an outcry because they segregated the audience. They sent black audience members to the gallery and made them sit separately to white audience members. That's again in the early history of God's one and only true organization. But things get f even uglier, I would argue, during the presidency of Joseph Rutherford. And I'm, I'm not going to read the quote because it's so obnoxious and grotesque. But suffice to say, these words that I'm showing you now appeared in the Golden Age, which was the forerunner to the Awake magazine, in the July 24th, 1929 issue. And they are not words that should be printed anywhere, least of all in one of the magazines of an organisation that purports to be representing God. And bear in mind, this is from the 1929 Golden Age. So this is 10 years after God has supposedly selected Watchtower or the leaders of Watchtower to be his faithful slave in 1919 and only 10 years later this is the sort of material that they're printing in their publications and again this is something that you are entirely oblivious to when you are a Jehovah's Witness you just don't have any clue that if you go far back enough in the publications, there is ample evidence that rather than being God's one and only true channel, uh, God's organization, Jehovah's organization, sorry, rather than having anything to do with God, this is just a man-made organization that has just got it wrong time and time and time again. So those are the 10 things that Jehovah's Witnesses don't know about their own religion. I hope you have found this video educational, especially if you happen to be a Jehovah's Witness. Let me know what you think in the comments below. But I guess that's about it. I hope you found this interesting. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.